Good evening and welcome to Silicon Valley Buzz, a television show where we discuss happenings in this, the most fertile spot on the planet for new ideas. I'm your, help, your host, Seth Shostak, but then again, you probably knew that. Tonight, we're going to talk about computer viruses, and in particular, one called shell shock, this shell shock bug. Could it be as uh, dangerous to your, to your computer as the Ebola virus might be to you? Well, tonight's guest will either assuage your fears or maybe simply reinforce them. Uh, so please help me welcome Tony Anscombe. Tony, thanks very much for being with Silicon Valley Buds tonight. Hi, great to be here, Seth. All right, you've got a title that says Ambassador of Free Products. Now, I, you know, that sounds like a combination of diplomacy and Santa Claus, so I gotta ask you about that. What does that mean, Ambassador of Free Products? Well, firstly, I work for AVG Technologies, and most people know AVG Technologies for our free antivirus product. Um, so, you know, I go around evangelizing about our free antivirus product, and ambassador seems a great term for that. Well, you're also a computer security and what is this? Security, what is it? Security, senior security evangelist. I can't even say it. All right, so we're talking computer security here. Yes, absolutely. I've spent the last 20 years in the computer security industry, uh, working for enterprise companies and, and consumer companies alike. Well, I mentioned here at the head of this show, shell shock. Now, uh, that seems to be, I don't know, shell shock sounds kind of debilitating. Tell me, what does shell shock do? Well, shell shock was a specific expl uh, vulnerability in uh, Linux, in, a, in something called Bash in Linux. Uh, and that's used in a number of different Server, server variants, but also on the Mac OS. Uh, so a lot of people with Macs who think they're completely safe, you know, a, 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 a vulnerability like that in their OS was particularly damning. Uh, uh, however, Apple were very quick to patch it. Um, so users of that operating system were, were safe quite quickly. Okay, now this was not introduced by Apple. It was a feature in their, in their operating system. I, say I have an Apple computer at home, right? Okay, I got an Apple laptop, whatever. Uh, how does shell shock look to me? Well, how would I know that I've been a victim of shell shock? What would it do? Well, shell shock allowed somebody to, uh, it's a vulnerability. So let, let's start with explaining the difference between a, a vulnerability, an exploit, uh, and a payload. Yeah? A vulnerability is something where somebody's written some code and basically there's a hole in it. So I I imagine this being the hole in the airport fence. Yeah? Then we have an exploit. So somebody writes something that can basically use that vulnerability to deliver something nasty. Crawl, crawl through the fence. So that's your van driver going through the fence. But of course, if the van's empty, there's no harm done. Yeah, or we hope there's no harm done, as long as he's not, not driving across the runway. Um, then he might have a payload, and that would typ uh, typically be your malware. That would be the bad stuff. Um, so in this, this case, shell shock was a vulnerability. You know, somebody could then write an exploit and, and deliver a piece of malware to it. Okay, so the problem is with the Apple software. I mean, where, where was the, which fence are we talking about? Was it the Mac operating system? Is it something on a server somewhere? Is it some, somewhere else? Where did this hole develop? So it was a, it's a utility, uh, a Linux utility, that's kind of an underlying part of the Mac OS. Uh, but you and I would never use it. It's only a really big, powerful user that would ever go into the Linux side of the OS and actually use something there. All right, and has it already infected uh, computers? I mean, is this, is this an extant problem, or is this a problem that's coming down the pike, or is this something from you know, two weeks ago we can forget about it now? I think this one is something we can forget about. I mean, like I say, Apple quickly released a patch for, uh, patch for it for their, uh, their operating system, and anybody that was administering a server with that Linux issue on there quickly patched it. Well, I apologize for being a little bit pathological here, Tony, but, but I still want to know, you know, okay, they, they want to get through this fence, this hole in the fence. They can get into, presumably, my computer, if I have the right kind of computer, and they can deliver a load. But that sounds like a euphemism for doing something really terrible. I mean, what sort of things would they do? Well, it can be, but we see, we see lots of computer viruses, I mean, every week. We see millions and millions uh, around the world, and they, they become obfuscated. So somebody will develop a virus, and then it changes, it morphs into something else, and somebody changes some of that code, and it, it continues to... Uh, you mean the load the changes, or the, the way it gets in changes? The exploit changes. So the vulnerability remains the same. So there's different vulnerabilities found in different pieces of software, whether it's a browser, an operating system, um, and more latterly, uh, mobile phones. 
Um, so the Android operating system has now malware, so somebody will write something uh, for, for one of those. Then, some, so somebody writes an, uh, an exploit to breach that vulnerability, yeah? And that's the clever part. Then they put the payload in, All right. that nasty payload. But, but you still, maybe, maybe you figure I'm not adult enough to hear this, but I, mean, <laughs> I still want to hear, I mean, if it gets into my phone or my laptop, I mean, you know, what does it do? Does it just sort of sit there and send a message back to the creator and say, you know, I'm in and, uh, you know, give me some points for that? Or does it do anything? Well, so let's take the Shellshock one as a good example. The Shellshock one specifically allowed somebody to have remote control of the machine. So they could actually execute commands and do things and take control of the machine you were on. So that's actually quite a scary one, which is why it was patched quickly and there was a, you know, there was a fairly big urgency to, for, for suppliers to actually get their software updated. So when you say take control of the machine, it can do anything you can do by typing into the machine? Yeah, remote, full remote control. All right, so, I mean, it could surf the web, but presumably <laughs> that's not what it's doing. I mean, it could take all my personal data, it could look around for, I don't know, credit card numbers or things like that. I mean, what, what is it uh, that they most like to do when they take control of my machine? I don't think they're doing it just for the compute power. Well, let's look at the virus industry as a whole. It's changed. If we go back 15 years, um, you know, those early versions of Windows and even back to the MS-DOS days, you know, going back a long time now, um, people wrote viruses to be disruptive. They, they wanted a badge of honor. You know, some script guy in the back of the bedroom was writing something and he'd make the Pac-Man walk across your screen. Uh, and he'd get the badge saying, well, I infect, infected 50,000 people. Wasn't it awesome? Just impressing his buddies. Just impressing his buddies. It was just a game, it, kind of a game, a disruptive game. Uh, I'm still not saying it was right as a game, obviously. Um, but today it's very, very different. It's about cybercrime. Yeah? So if I can steal your identity, if I can uh, aggregate pieces of your identity with other data, then potentially I can commit financial fraud uh, and gain you know, reward from it. So actually, when I want to infect your machine, I don't want to be seen. I don't want you to know I'm there. Because all the time you don't know I'm there, I'm collecting more and more data about you, which gives me more value. So what you're saying is, uh, this shell shock virus, if it got into my machine, I might not even know. I mean, is it just going to sit there quietly stealing stuff, sending it somewhere else, and suddenly I get my credit card bill and, you know, somebody's bought a house with it? Well, potentially, that's what, yeah, that's what modern malware is there doing, it is stealing your identity. Um, you know, like I say, Shellshot was, was very quickly patched, yeah? So, you know, but there have been other big, uh, big vulnerabilities this year. I mean, we've had Heartbleed, uh, the SSL vulnerability, if you remember, that was, that was stealing login data uh, on certain websites. You know, we've had Poodle, which you was mean a variant. just my password kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely, and that's already part of your identity. So, all right, it, now you said back in the good old days, <laughs> although you were quick to point out they weren't actually good, but in any case, they were slightly more innocent. Uh, this was just some guy in his back bedroom, you know, just having fun because he understood how computers work. He was able to find these holes in the fences, these vulnerabilities, and so they get in there just for the, for the fun of it. Is that still the case? Who's doing this now? Where did Shellshock come from? Well, the vulnerabilities are typically found by researchers. Uh, so you'll find you know, big companies, you know, for example, we have a, a, a research department, and they look for vulnerabilities in software, and you'll find that most, most researchers are responsible people, so they look for a, a vulnerability in software, and they will actually notify the person whose vulnerability it is. So if you find a vulnerability in a piece of software, you contact the supplier in turn and say, hey, you have this vulnerability, you need to fix it. Of course, at some stage, for everybody then to patch a server, so for example, the Shellshock issue with people that had Linux web servers, at some stage you have to become public in turn and say, hey, there is this vulnerability. So everybody becomes, ah, we need to patch our servers and fix the issue. But hopefully by then, somebody's already written the fix. Yeah, but what you're saying is, at some point, this becomes public knowledge that there's a hole in the fence, and that's when these bad guys can jump in and try and grab whatever they can before it's fixed. But it's also at the time where somebody shouts, shouts there's a hole in the fence, you know, and we all go and stand by the fence to make sure nobody comes through. All right, okay, but that still doesn't tell me, you know, who's doing that. I mean, you, you, you say that it's the good guys who are finding the vulnerabilities. So your company, AVG, do you have people who are looking at operating systems and saying, look, let's, let's make sure that this is actually, you know, pretty well sealed up, and if not, we're going to let somebody know? Or are these vulnerabilities, you know, found some other way by accident or somebody who happened to have worked for a company and, you know, goes bad, goes rogue, goes Mustang? 
I mean, how, how, do this, how does this information get out to the, to the hackers? Well, obviously the worst instance is where actually a hacker finds the vulnerability and doesn't tell anyone. Because then he can exploit that vulnerability, you know, put his nasty payload on your machine, and nobody knows what's going on. You know, companies like us, well, what we're doing is also is looking for the exploit. We're looking at how it's exploited, and we're looking at the payload. Yeah, and specifically the payload, because that's the virus, the trojan, the worm, or whatever it is that they're going to dump onto your machine and actually use to infect your machine. So if we can stop the payload, yeah, um, yeah, other vendors need to be stopping their vulnerabilities in their software. All right, so AVG, uh, should I look at it as a, I don't know, a virus uh, prevention software company? I mean, are they making a product that I put on my machine and it, you know, it's like a sentinel walking back and forth, making sure that <laughs> nobody unauthorized gets in there? Well, I think the, the way to think of our product is, um, it's kind of a layered security approach. So imagine, you know, we're, what we're doing is building, we're building a layer of fences around the airport. Um, and the fences stop different things, you know, stop different things. So one fence might be there looking at traffic coming down the road. Another fence might be looking at people walking past. Another fence might be looking for people trying to come over, uh, you know, people trying to come over the fence. So it's a layered approach, and and you know you might get over the first fence, but there's another fence right behind it that will stop you in a different way. Are, are your customers mostly individuals, or are they companies? We have both. Uh, we have uh, 188 million customers uh, using our software. 90 million of them on mobile devices. Yeah, so a big user base in uh, in the Android platform. Yeah. Um, and we have a business product as well with about 15 million users. Okay, because these, there are big numbers here. I, I want to read you something I read on a blog here about Shellshock. Uh, it could potentially affect half of all websites on the internet. That's, you know, that's a half, a half a trillion websites and billions more internet connected devices such as routers, smartphones, and so forth. And it apparently is very simply exploited. In other words, it doesn't take tremendous coding skill to exploit this this vulnerability and get in there and get the computer to do what it was going to do. I mean, that sounds like an extremely dangerous thing. That, that could bring a, a large fraction of our interconnectivity to, to a halt, or am I ex exaggerating here? No, I mean, I mean, you're right, but you also have to think about what's, what the content of a web server is. So if we're looking at the, the content of a, a web server just with some content about you know, what's going on in your local town, right. yeah, if that's vulnerable, yes, it's, it's not great, because it could be used to put other things on the web server and deliver maybe drive-by downloads or, or malware in some way when you visit the web page. But it's also you know, not collecting your personal data. I'd be more concerned if my, ba yeah, my bank was infected and I was trying to you know, move funds from one account to another. But a lot of, uh, yeah, most big organizations have very, very good policies in place where when a vulnerability like this is found, they start a procedure to actually fix their servers very quickly. Well, you, you mentioned the vulnerability of a bank. I mean, the thing you see on television all the time is they're going to attack, for example, you know, the, the electrical distribution systems, right? They're just going to power the place down by turning off all the computers <laughs> in the local PG&E here, whatever, right? That kind of thing. So th those are industrial targets, and those would maybe not interest so much, you know, a lone hacker, as we've been describing them in the back bedroom. I mean, the back bedroom guy might be happy to have, you know, something really funny appear on everybody's screen at midnight or something like that. I mean, where, where is the action now in terms of these things? Uh, where, where is it going? Is it, you know, sort of large scale going after big companies or is it still, hey, let's just see if we can't erase everybody's hard drive just for the fun of it? I think the fun element has, dis has gone. Like I say, malware writers now, it's a business. Yeah, if I can steal your, if if I can steal some of your data in one way, and maybe have data already I've collected from a from a data breach. You know, we we remember the target and other other data breaches. There's some been been Home some depot. Yeah, yeah, there's been some very large ones in the last twelve months. Um, you know, if I can aggregate that data together and build a big picture of you, potentially I've got enough data to commit fraud on your identity. Um, you know, it's a very good movie, Identity Thief. You know, while it's a comedy, you know, there's an element of truth in the movie too. You know, it's based on some principles. So, all right. So, they can do what they want, but they're more likely to attack the local big business if there is a local big business than they are to attack me as just a, a user who's just surfing the web, doing whatever I do when I surf the web. I mean, I, I, should I? 
I, I guess what I'm trying to get out is, should I be terribly worried about this? I mean, I've got some protective software. It came with my operating system, you know, and it says it's good. You're, you can relax, take a break, light them if you got them. I mean, is that the case or should I be worried? Well, you should always be worried. So, so there's a number of things. One, one is you should always have an antivirus product on your machine. So we at IVG produce an antivirus product. You should have an antivirus product on your phone if it's an Android phone as well because it's still a connection to the internet. Um, but let, let, let's just talk about what you do online as well. I mean, do you shop? Yes. Yeah. So when you shop, you always shop with a reputable vendor? Well, I, it hasn't always been that way, but I mean, they, they were in business. They were <laughs> legitimate stores, put it that way, uh, reputable. Uh, yeah. Maybe asking too much. But. But, but you know, today is Cyber Monday. Yes. So, so it's a big shopping day. And lots of people will go into the search engine and type for whatever it is they want to buy. And they will look for the cheapest place, not necessarily always knowing their vendor. You know, so when I then go to buy, buy on that website, do I store my credit card details? Or do I type them in and say you can't store them? You know, unfortunately, as consumers, most people will store them thinking, I might come back and buy something else from there. It right. will be simpler next time. Maybe we shouldn't be leaving all the elements of data all over the internet with all those different providers. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things about Shellshock, I keep returning to Shellshock because that is the big uh, example of recent time, although you say I shouldn't be Shellshocked anymore. It's, <laughs> it's past tense. But it had the capability because it could take over your computer. It could, you know, it could compute things in a way. It might be able to turn itself into a worm where instead of just sitting there, you know, it makes copies of itself and then goes to somebody else's computer and that way sort of proliferates around the Internet. Uh, did Shellshock have that capability? Well, like I say, Shellshock was a vulnerability. So, you know, if somebody can then take remote control mm. of your machine and, mm. and put something else on, that's the malware. And that's why you need an antivirus product to detect the malware that that, that you know, would be the payload. Um, the issue with that particular, you know, particular one as well is, of course, it was affecting the Mac platform. Um, well, most people with a Mac computer sit there and go, well, there are no viruses for Mac. Right. Well, as we've just seen, there are potential vulnerabilities in Mac and uh, you know, people do write viruses for Mac. You know, the bigger their market share count becomes, the more lucrative it, lucrative it becomes for somebody to write malware for that platform. To what extent is the threat of these kinds of, well, malware, responsible for the fact that every time I shut down my computer now, it spends another 10 minutes downloading updates. And I figure, I don't know if I'm getting more functionality in, in, in my word processor, or am I just getting updated code to close all these holes in the fence? A, a bit of both. If you actually look at the upda updates uh, on those certain times of the month or, or week when the, the updates come down, it will be a mix. It will be a mix of code updates, uh, features and functionality, but you'll also have a mix in there of security updates. So that, yes, patching that fence. W would that problem go away if I took all that software off my machine and just you know operated in the cloud, right? There's some sort of common base of software. So they're taking care of the maintenance and I don't have to sit there and watch this blue screen or whatever color it is for the next three minutes before I can walk away. Well, you still need something to get to the cloud. So you still have an <laughs> element of operating win, system. I can't win, Tony. I mean, it's not so good. <laughs> No, of course you can win. I mean, you can be safe. You can be a responsible consumer with a machine. You know, if, if, if you and I go down to Best Buy and we buy ourselves a you know, nice, nice shiny new laptop, you know, we already know it needs antivirus software. Yeah, I mean, we've known that for a long time. So you're going to walk out. It's going to have something probably preloaded. You're going to, or you're going to unload that and load maybe our product yeah, onto the machine. So the first thing you should do is make sure it's always updated and make sure the operating system continually updates itself. Then, it, then it's about what you do with the machine. A lot of computer security is actually about your education, about making sure that you understand that you should stay safe. What about the kinds of stories you see frequently? In fact, there was one on 60 Minutes, which is a news show, television news show recently, in which you know, the hacking is now being done by governments. It isn't, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a long way from that guy in the back bedroom now. I mean, the entire governments that want to get into, obviously, infrastructure, uh, establishments in a different country so they can shut the country down. I mean that the biggest weapon of war now is this kind of activity. It isn't how many planes or boats you've got ships. So, you know, is, is there truth in that? And how does that affect me, the car buyer? Well, the, the, I was going to say there have been a number of instances. In, in fact, there's been you know, uh, one recently in, in the last few weeks where the malware looks, looks and feels like it was generated by a government because of the complexity and, and, 
and how it works and, and what it's doing. And it's aimed at industry or, or, or power plants or whatever it is, infrastructure of a country, uh, country. I mean, that is an issue, but it's not an issue for you and I as a consumer. It's, that's an issue more for, you know, is it right for a government to, to actually write malware that would attack another country's infrastructure? Um, I think that's a question for our politicians and maybe not for well, me. I, I think many people <laughs> will have heard of Stuxnet, right? This yeah. was developed, well, who knows who developed it, but developed it, but we, we, we think we know who developed it. And the U.S. was certainly involved, if not the principal developer. And this was designed to attack the uh, Iranian centrifuges, you know, for enriching uranium. But what I've heard is that Stuxnet is so good that it's gotten out of those centrifuges <laughs> and just moving to other machines. And maybe it's going to shut down the local power plant. <laughs> they maybe you know. Uh, do we ultimately have control of these things, or can they be like a, I don't know von Neumann machines? They can reproduce and they can you know they can spread themselves, and it's it's like a real virus that being able to shut it down might not be so obvious. Well, the good thing is, is obviously Stuxnet as an example. I mean, once it's once it's in the public domain, companies like us will actually block it. You know, we'll we'll detect it and block it. Um, the the one recently, uh, Reagan, Reagan. Yes. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how we pronounce it. You, know, you have to uh, ask the software. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I'm English, so I pronounce it maybe a different way. Yeah. Uh, but if we, you know, if we look at that one specifically, you know, it, there's lots of curiosity whether it was actually written by the NSA or the GCHQ who wrote it. What's it for? You know, and what can it do? It can do an awful lot. It can take lots of information off your machine and do sorts of, all sorts of things. You know, is it right or is it wrong? Uh, I, well, whether it's right or wrong, I mean, it's somewhat beside the point, isn't it? Because people are going to do it. They're already doing it, and they're already worried that this is, you know, you can look at the guy's fleet of tanks, but that, that's not so important now. You have to look at his fleet of coders. Right? Well, yeah, I, I mean, war, you know, warfare is also industrial. I mean, it, you know, just not just military anymore. It's, uh, yeah, it's a game. Yeah, it's a game. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's no doubt that the greatest, maybe the great, the greatest technical revolution of the past few decades has been the development of the internet. Uh, you know, everyone can have access to more information than the Library of Congress. Somebody asks a question at a party, and, <laughs> you know, and you, you may not know the answer, but you can get the answer within seconds by, you know, asking Siri or something like that. That's the incredible upside. But the incredible downside is that bad actors can mess this up. We, we hear about the Internet of Things coming down the pike, where my refrigerator will start talking to my toaster, or talking to the waffle iron, or whatever it is, and talking to the stuff in my, you know, on my body, you know, measuring my heart rate. It, it sounds to me like, you know, that sounds good, but is it going to be good, given all this? Well, uh, let, let's, let's go back. I mean, uh, you, you use a very good example, fitness, you know, fitness bands and, and fitness trackers and health rates and, and all that, that type of information. I mean, one thing we, we should do as, as consumers is understand what companies are collecting. Maybe not just what the bad guys are collecting, but think about your own privacy. You know, what happens if you've, you've allowed somebody with a health band, you know, you've given your information to a health band willingly because you want to know about your health rate and right. you like the charts it produces and what it tells you you need to do each day. But what if that company also is aggregating the data and collecting data somewhere else and maybe sharing that data with your health provider, your insurance company? Yeah, you know, you might turn around and say you only you know, you walk ten miles a day. Yeah, what if, what if your insurance company turns around and says, "Well, we know you don't." Yes. Yeah. Um, but that's a concern. Yeah, that's a different issue. That's a privacy issue. Yes, that that sounds like there's something you could fix by fiat by requiring that all the personal data about my. I mean, I, I would love to have my the, the metrics of my health be shared insofar as that might help with you know the idea of big data. It might help to cure some diseases. So I'm all for that. But I would probably want to insist that they strip all the personal information away so they never know that it's that guy who's only walking 0.01 <laughs> mile a day, right, and he's got a bad heart or whatever it is, right? I mean, that, that I can see being fixed. But I'm worried that once you connect everything to everything, it may be very vulnerable to these kinds of uh, bad practices. Yeah, exactly. But that's, that maybe, that's, maybe that was my point of, you know, you're willing to share that data, but you're willing to share it in an anonymized fashion. Hmm. Yeah. But if it's being stored not in an, anon an anonymized fashion, then what happens if somebody does have a data breach? Yeah. You know, if we hear one, uh, the next big company that has a data breach suddenly had all your health records and your social security number and et cetera, et cetera, it can be pretty personal. 
You know, Tony, I've got to say, I had a personal computer in 1977. <laughs> right, the one I have at home today, I, I reckon, is now ten thousand times more powerful and probably cheaper too. Actually, okay, but I did have one in 1977. It wasn't connected to anything except the power plug in the wall, right? And if I wanted to get data in and out, uh, you know, I use a cassette tape or a floppy or something like that. Okay, I never thought of security. Never once crossed my mind security. But then, you know, somebody said, well, you got to worry about this as soon as I'm connected with the net and I get some security software. And, and I'm beginning to wonder, well, at, at, at what point do I? get to stop worrying about this. And what I'm hearing you saying is, there's never going to be a real ultimate fix. There's never going to be a point like that. No, I mean, security software is there to protect you. I mean, it, it's a bit like, you know, if we go back probably several hundred years, people didn't have a lock on their front door. Yeah, you know, they just had the handle that, that, that actually shut the front door. You know, when did we start putting a lock on? Yeah, we didn't stop people m walking past our house. It didn't change. Uh, so, you know, it just becomes that we need to be more conscious of how we do things, what we share, but also have our soft, you know, good security software there to protect us. Yeah, well, we don't have much time, but as long as I'm seeing the glass half empty here <laughs> tonight, let me ask about this. You know, we, we've mentioned e-commerce a little bit and you know, credit cards and all that, and that all works because prime numbers are used to encode keys so that that remains secure. But we're on the verge of developing quantum computers and they can break the prime number codes. Uh, are we still going to have e-commerce, or should I start investing in brick-and-mortar stores? Well, well actually, let, let, let's talk about the credit card online and, and shopping. You know, it is Cyber Monday, so it's very, very relevant. You, know, you have in your pocket, I'm sure, several credit cards like I do. I have one in my pocket that I only ever use for online purchases, and it has a very small credit limit on it. So if my data gets breached at any time, yeah, it's limited. Yeah, so any attack against me, I can easily, easily stop it immediately. Yeah, it sounds like a, a good way to move. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, the internet, a boon and a blight, apparently. Let's hope that the good guys always stay out in front. I want to thank my guest, Tony Anscombe. Thanks so very much, Tony, for being with us tonight. I'd also like to thank uh, KMVT, who brought you this show completely virus-free from the Silicon <laughs> Valley. Uh, thanks to our expert KMVT staff, our director, Bobby Chastain, and especially to our hardworking series producer, Susan Hubbard, I'm Seth Shostak, suggesting that you join us next month for Silicon Valley Buzz.